When I was a student at college, I read physics and philosophy, and one of the most frequent comments that I used to get was when I told people what I was studying, oh, that's a strange combination. And I must have, I never found it that strange because both physics and philosophy are subjects in which we inquire into the nature of what's real, into the nature of the universe, into the nature of reality. And it's true that the subjects have different methods. Uh, in physics, we might do experiments, we might look for observational data, whereas philosophy is more something you could do in your own armchair without having to get your hands dirty doing actual experiments. It's more of a, a thinking kind of subject. But they're both trying to find out what's true about the world. They're both trying to find out uh, where the world comes from, what the world really is. And in particular, if you think about some of the deeper questions that physics raises, questions about the nature of reality, the questions about the origins of the universe, where it came from, whether or not it was planned or designed, whether there's a purpose behind the universe. These are questions which both science and philosophy have a lot to say about. So let's uh, think a little bit about some of those questions. I'm going to explain three that have particularly interested me in the course of my studies. The first was a question which I wrote a thesis about, and that was the question of origins. If the universe began with the Big Bang, as we understand it did from modern cosmology, where did the Big Bang come from? Did the Big Bang have a cause? And if it did have a cause, was that cause supernatural? Was it God? Could it have come about without a cause? Could it have come about because, for example, the universe was the effect of some prior event? A big crunch, maybe, before the Big Bang. What's interesting about these questions, regardless of what answer you come to, is that they so clearly indicate how, beyond physics, there lies this realm of philosophical questions. Because none of us knows, none of us were there, none of us have done any, have any direct observational experience that will answer this for us. So we're in the realm where we have to speculate, we have to ask questions, we have to try to come up with the best possible theory, but we don't know. And so there's a mystery, a mystery where some people put the word God in there, other people prefer not to use that word, other people think that in a sense the question can't even be asked. Um, perhaps we can't talk about what came before, perhaps there was no before, perhaps before only has a meaning where there is time, and if time began with the universe, then we can't say anything. That would be pretty disappointing, but that's a theory as well. So we have this profound question about origins, and it so obviously links to physics, and it's also so obviously a question where philosophy has got a lot to say. So that's one reason why, as I said, I can't take it seriously when people say well, physics and philosophy are totally different. Clearly they're connected and clearly they link when we're studying questions like this. So that's one question which has really interested me. Um, does there have to be a cause? It's a really interesting problem. Why do we think that events do have causes? That's based on our experience. But remember here we're dealing with a world which is far beyond anything any of us have directly experienced. How do we know that the same laws apply? Perhaps cosmological origins are governed by very, very different laws. And perhaps one day we will find those laws, perhaps we won't. Perhaps this will be forever a boundary to our knowledge. So there's a question about the principle of cause and effect and how it can apply and whether it could apply in the case of the origins of the universe. So that's one really interesting set of, set of questions where physics and philosophy come together. Closely connected to that, and this was really for me the next issue that I began to look at, is the very nature of time itself. What is time? In one way it's the most familiar thing to us all. I mean, we all live in time, we experience time, we talk about time passing. But as soon as we begin to think about the very nature of time, it's again deeply, deeply mysterious. Is, for example, time 
the same as change. That's Aristotle's theory. He, he thought that time was the measure of change. But there could be periods of time in which nothing changed. Isaac Newton, the great physicist, had what's called an absolute theory of time. Time, he thought, was just there. Uh, time existed before the Big Bang. Time existed for infinity past. Uh, the universe began at a moment in time, but before the universe was created, there was still time. And if the universe disappears, time will keep going. Time, he thought, just goes on and on. And in some ways, that's a very nice and intuitive view of time. It sort of seems to make some sense. We, we have this idea that time is just there. But if there was time before the Big Bang, what made the Big Bang happen at the time it did? Even if you bring God in here, there's a problem, because how would God know which moment to use as the moment of creation? Every moment in past time, for an, and there'd be an infinite number of those, every single one of those moments would be as good as any others for creating a universe. So what reason would God have for choosing a particular moment in time? Well, this argument appealed to the physicist and philosopher Gottfried Leibniz, and Leibniz said that Newton had made a fundamental error in his understanding of time. Time isn't there. Time only comes into being when things happen. Time is a relationship between events. And so Leibniz's relational view, according to that, the universe begins at a moment which we call the Big Bang, and time itself was created at that moment. So time didn't pre-exist the Big Bang. Now, that view of time, or time links to material events in the universe, appealed to Einstein. And Einstein took it a step further in his theory of relativity. And in Einstein's view, and this is borne out by experiment, time isn't simply a relationship between events, it's also a set of relationships which involves and, and links to uh, movement. So if you're in motion, according to Einstein, if you're moving, you experience time differently from someone who's stationary. And the simplest uh, illustration of this is the so-called twins paradox. If you had a twin who uh, set off in a spaceship at, say, a quarter of the speed of light to a nearby star and then returned, when you got when that twin got back to Earth, that twin would have experienced less time than you. That twin would now be younger than the twin who'd remained on Earth. And this seems incredibly paradoxical. But it's borne out by experiments. We have particles travelling through the atmosphere at high speeds from space, cosmic rays, and they last longer when they're moving at high velocity than they would if they were created in the laboratory at rest. So it seems that time changes in relation to, to your motion, in that time is relative to, to motion. This theory, incidentally, was further generalised by Einstein when he linked time and space and gravitation in the general theory of relativity. And that theory led uh, other thinkers, such as the mathematician Kurt Gödel, Gödel, to come up with a theory according to which time could be closed in loops so you could actually go on a journey uh, in certain universes and end up before you came, before you began. You could travel into the past. You could literally travel through time and go back to the past in certain universes. And it's extraordinary to think that this idea isn't just part of science fiction, as it obviously is, but is actually taken seriously by philosophers and scientists who think deeply about the nature of time. So once again, it shows us how mysterious the nature of time is and how closely connected the problem of time in physics is to philosophical considerations. One final set of problems. Uh, the theory of quantum mechanics is one which philosophers and physicists wrestle with. And quantum mechanics is problematic to us because it undermines, again, a deep-seated notion that everything that happens has to have a cause that makes it happen. Uh, that was really the assumption behind modern science. We look for causes and we expect that every physical event will have some prior physical cause. And that assumption has worked very well right up until the early part of the 20th century when we started to discover that there were certain events like an electron jumping from one orbit level to another in an atom 
or uh, uranium nucleus which spontaneously decays from one form of uranium to another. And these events seem to happen with no cause to make them happen. You can pick two uranium nuclei, which were pretty much identical in terms of their physical properties. One of them decays, the other doesn't, and there's nothing that will tell you which one's going to decay first. So it seems as though the principle that every event has a cause which makes it happen isn't in fact true in our universe. That could link back to the theory of the Big Bang. Perhaps the Big Bang didn't need to have a cause. But it also raises a really interesting question about probability and certainty. Because if everything can, if things can happen which have no cause that made them happen, we have to start thinking about physics, not in terms of absolute knowledge, but in terms of probabilities. And the theory of quantum mechanics is really a theory about probability, about uh, how we can explain events, even though we can't totally determine which ones are going to occur. And this is captured very famously in Schrodinger's paper, in which he discusses the diabolical situation, as he describes it, of a cat stuck in a box with a nuclear device, which, if it uh, spontaneously decays, as we said, in an indeterministic fashion, which can't be predicted, it will release poison, which will kill the cat. So the cat, in one possible scenario, is dead because it's been poisoned by this random event. But there's also the possibility that event never happens and the cat stays alive. Now, what's mysterious is that the quantum mechanical description of this situation is one in which the cat is, as it were, in both of those states at the same time. There is nothing in the quantum mechanics that will tell you, if you describe that situation, whether or not the cat is dead or alive. And so in some sense, according to the theory, both of these possibilities are real at the same time. Now this is really very mysterious, deeply, deeply problematic and, and very, very interesting to both physicists and philosophers. But one solution to the problem is to say, as Einstein did, that actually the cat really is in one state or the other and we just don't know. That's a theory called realism. But realism isn't easy to fit into quantum mechanics for various technical reasons. It's also a theory which Lots of people felt Einstein came to, as it were, almost by a prejudice. He was just completely determined to hold on to this principle that every event has to have a cause. And he wasn't prepared to accept the seeming conclusions of the theory itself, which said that actually some things don't happen for, for, for causes. There are, there are some events which are, in a sense, intrinsically random. So that was Einstein's take on the problem. Another problem, another way of thinking about the theory is to say, Actually, the cat is both dead and alive at the same time. It's just in parallel branches of reality. So according to this theory, which is taken seriously by many philosophers of physics, the uh, cat isn't a single entity in a single universe. In, in some sense, the different possible states correspond to different universes or different branches of reality. In one of them, the cat dies. In another, the cat is alive. This is the so-called multiverse theory. And, as I say, it's taken very seriously by thinkers who take quantum mechanics seriously. Can we really believe that? Can we really take seriously the thought that there could be an infinite number of other worlds in which every possibility is actualised? It's an extraordinary theory, uh, but some people would say that's what quantum mechanics is pushing us towards. So whatever your take on that, once again you can see that the physics is pushing us into some pretty deep and pretty philosophical territory. So we can see again that however we think about these questions, they're not just questions that are going to be sorted out by doing some experiments. They're questions that really require us to think. They're questions that really require us to do some philosophy.